Hello, everyone. Um, I'm actually giving a slightly different talk to the one that is advertised, um, but it contains a lot of the same information. Um, my talk is going to be basically the results of the last roughly year from Google's no-cost shuttle program. Um, if you want to follow along, um, the slides can be found at this link. Um, and this link should be found at the bottom of um, most of my slides. Um, so firstly, who am I? Um, I'm a software engineer at heart. I've been here at Google for 14 years, and I've been doing open source since 1994. Um, I'm part of uh, a group at Google that focuses on engineering productivity. We don't build products ourselves. We help the rest of Google be more efficient in developing products. And so I work with pretty much all other parts of Google, including places like Google Cloud, Google Research, Google Platforms, Google Security, pretty much any group, including groups at our partners at Alphabet and things like, you know, Wing and Waymo. Um, and as part of that, I've now been looking into hardware. And I've been doing this for a couple of years now and have ended up in kind of a management and leadership role. So most of what I'm talking about today is not work I directly did, it is work that team and open source people I work with and academics that I work with who have done this excellent work. Um, I just sit in meetings and do budgets and things like that. But occasionally I do get to give presentations about all the cool things that are happening. Um, and it's why I'm willing to sit in um, you know, meetings all day. So firstly, why is Google interested in this topic? Well, Google's a software company, but from the 14 years I've been at Google, one thing I really know is to run the software Google runs, we need computers. And we need a lot of computers. Pretty much all products that Google cares about has exponential growth rates. If you look at these graphs, Almost all these graphs are logarithmic scale, which means if you draw a straight line, demand is growing exponentially. And with demand growing exponentially, we're looking for growth in hardware to keep up with that demand. And we really want a large amount of performance increase, not 10x, we're looking for 1,000x. And there used to be a really nice um, thing that happened in the silicon industry that over the years, you would do nothing and your hardware would just get faster. And this was awesome. But as people who have seen this graph before um, notice, things have slowly started to go wrong. Um, we're no longer getting significant performance improvements on our general purpose hardware. Um, and this is kind of called the death of Moore's law, even though traditionally the number of transistors is still growing exponentially, we're no longer getting the performance improvements that we used to. But there's still plenty of room for improvement. If you take a native, um, uh, you know, matrix multiply in Python, and you convert it just to specialized SIMD instructions, you're looking at a 63,000x performance improvement. Um, if you then move it into hardware, you can roughly get a similar type of massive performance improvement. And so there's still plenty of room to get these type of performance improvements we need to keep up with demand. But we see a future where we need to do a lot more custom hardware to do that. And custom hardware, 
you know, has already been shown to be able to give these type of massive speed ups. If you look at Google's TensorFlow processing unit, you'll see that it was able to deliver us performance that is significantly faster than um, Moore's law was previously able to give us. Um, some people have said it's like we skipped seven years in one step. Um, but the more hardware we do, the more we notice this aspect that um, lots of people in the industry has been warning about for a long time is that the type of performance we're expecting from a process technology and the actual realized um, performance continues to diverge from and continue to diverge significantly more. Again, these are logarithmic scales on these graphs. At the same time, as this diverging is happening, we're also seeing a massive increase in design costs and verification costs. So I've come into this space to try and change that and get us back onto a place where we have faster, cheaper, and more custom silicon. And again, we're looking for this massive type of growth. And one of the key things I look at when I examine these type of spaces is number of users. And the number of users really has a really big impact on a lot of different things because of a concept called rights law. And if you look at hardware engineers in um, the US, they're about 70K, um, 70,000 hardware engineers, and they're growing about 6% year on year, which is a respectable um, growth rate. But if you look at software engineers, um, there's 800,000 software engineers in the US, and the number of software engineers is growing at 30% year on year. So what I really wanna do is see how we can convert these software engineers into hardware engineers. And I believe to do that, what we need is a lot more open collaboration. And I think the really cool thing about RISC-V is it's shown that this open collaboration can really, you know, drive a new amount of innovation in an area that previously wasn't actively changing much. And to support that, as of today, we actually launched a new website called developers.google.com slash silicon, which is a site to help people collaborate on building silicon with Google. And the thing I'm mostly going to talk about is that when I came into this space, it was clear we needed more open collaboration, and I wanted to understand what was blocking open collaboration. So, and I wrote a paper about this at ICAD 20, and I identified four major roadblocks, of which the most significant was the lack of a manufacturable PDK that was fully open. And if you go and look at some of my older talks, you can understand why a manufacturable PDK is so important to the whole um, ecosystem. And so with the fact that a manufacturable PDK was missing, the great thing about working at Google is I had an idea and working at Google enabled me to test this idea. The hypothesis was that we could do three things and together these three things would actively enable a massive amount of new open source collaboration. And the three things I saw were, we needed a fully open source PDK that didn't need any NDA to sign, didn't need 
you to ask anything. You just should be able to go somewhere and clone it. The PDK needed to be paired with fully open source EDA tools that also didn't require you to ask permission. You basically were able to use the tools, whether you were a teeny single person hobbyist or whether you're a hundred million dollar, you know, massive company. Um, you are able to use the same tools. And lastly, that we had a silicon program that encouraged people to collaborate through and realize their silicon into actual objects. The big difference between software and IC design is that you actually get a real thing at the end. And so somebody needs to pay for that real thing. And luckily, someone like Google is able to afford to do that to promote collaboration and to promote the ability for us to try a lot of new things. And so this three-part hypothesis is what I had back in 2019, and we started executing on it. And we really believe that the key part here is having a fully open source PDK because it enables better RTL designs like RISC-V cores, and it enables better open source tools for designing ASICs. So I had this idea. Um, this idea was back in 2019 or actually 2018. Um, how is this thing going? So in June 2020, um, I was happy to announce as part of the first talk in the Fossey dial-up series that Google had partnered with Skywater to release a fully open source PDK. This PDK is 130 nanometer um, process technology. It was actually manufacturable. You didn't, um, it wasn't a fake PDK, it was a real PDK. And it was available on GitHub, just like software projects. It was licensed under an Apache 2 license, which is an open source initiative approved license. It's a fully permissive license with proper patent grants. And the code is just there on GitHub. You can go and clone it right now. You don't have to ask me permission or anything. There's no NDAs to sign. There's no salespeople to convince that you're a real person or any of these type of things. You can just do it. This 130 nanometer process technology is also a fairly capable 130 nanometers in that it includes a lot of extras like support for high voltage IOs, support for high voltage, um, you know, extended drain NMOS. It has inductors and high sheet row poly resistors and MIM caps and sonar cells. Um, this is quite a lot of different functionality. And as a software engineer, I don't necessarily know what all of this means, but it's definitely a all-inclusive node. And what we discovered is that in the first week after we had done this announcement, the Skywater PDK had almost as many stars as repositories that had been out there for significantly longer life cycles like the Yosis and Chisel project. As well, we were seeing in a two-week period roughly 1,250 unique users looking at the PDK on GitHub and about 5,000 different views. And this is, seems like a pretty big number to actually start off something that in many ways is quite an old process technology. Um, we really think the open source nature of this makes it significantly more interesting because it opens up access to everyone. As well, there is a Slack community that is dedicated to this. And this Slack community has over 3,000 members in it. And anyone can join, whether you're an academic, whether you're a hobbyist, whether you're a professional, whether you're something in between. Um, you can go to the Join Skywater Tools site and 
um, just come and join us and hang out and talk about implementing silicon. And there's a huge number of channels on this Slack dedicated to things like analog design and risk V and developing courses using the open source tools and open source PDK. Lastly, the important thing that a lot of people um, uh, really liked was that we were running and still are running an open source MPW program, which was managed by our partner eFabulous. We were providing the money and Skywater Dewey's was doing the manufacturing. And this was free to anyone who was willing to contribute to that open source community by your design being open source. One of the things though, that coming from a software background is that I think it's important to realize that failure is a big part of learning. And we really wanted to change the way people think about silicon so that silicon design isn't a precious, you know, carefully considered type thing. We want to do a lot of it quickly and we want people to fail and try again as quickly as possible. We want a launch and iterate type approach. And this is what drove a lot of our decisions about how we did this. And when we look at what we were doing, what we have is we released a fully open source PDK. That was, you know, a very new thing. Nobody had done that at 130 nanometers. We also integrated that PDK with open source tools. Um, nobody had done manufacturing of 130 nanometer tool, uh, 130 nanometer chips with these tools before, um, especially not the Skywater process. And we were running a new program to do the aggregation of this. All three parts of my hypothesis were new. And I really want to, you know, hammer that home that each part of these things was new so that we expected it to be a bumpy ride. When you try a lot of new things, you're going to do things wrong occasionally, and that's okay. So our plan looked like this. We had the first shuttle on um, November 2020 called MPW Run. Then we had a second run in mid-2020 and multiple more runs in 2021, and then more this year in 2022. And so this is kind of what the state looked like um, now. We had in 2020, 45 designs um, submitted as part of this program. Then in 2021, we had over 200 designs done. We are hoping to have even more in 2022, I've actually set the goal at roughly a thousand designs done in 2022. And at this time, we knew that at least some stuff worked because we had done a couple of test chips with the open source tools and the open source PDK and silicon for that had come back and these test chips look like this. They were done by eFabulous and they're called the Strive series. Um, if you want to find out more about them, um, Mohammed Kassam actually gave a talk as part of the Fossey Foundation's dial-up talk series about the Strive thing. Um, and so we had some working chips. And so we're reasonably confident about that you could make working chips with these technologies. And so some point we were in a state where we had sent mpw1 off for manufacturing chip ignite which is a commercial program from eFabless, had also been sent off for manufacturing and mpw2 had been submitted for processing but hadn't yet um been manufactured and at that point 
we got the silicon back from MPW1. Um, we had always designed this program to be fairly pipeline-like because of the long time it takes with getting um, silicon back. And when we got MPW1 back, what we discovered is that unfortunately, there was a bunch of issues in the harness project that was used in MPW1. If you want to understand exactly what went wrong with MPW1, um, Matt Venn, who I believe is giving a talk um, later today, actually has a video about what was going wrong with the MPW1 SOC. And since MPW1 had just come back, um, we still had two other things in flight. So what we ended up doing is issuing a hold for MPW2. Um, and um, in the meantime, MPW3 was submitted. Um, and so we now had MPW2 and MPW3 on hold while we try and fix the issues discovered with MPW1. Um, but unfortunately, um, uh, sorry, uh, unfortunately, the silicon for Chip Ignite 1 had actually already been sent for manufacturing. It hadn't finished manufacturing yet, but it was in the process of being manufacturing. So eFabless did something really cool, which you can watch a talk again from Muhammad Qasem about how they were managed to fix the Chip Ignite chips only using metal changes because the metal layers hadn't been done yet. And this is really, really cool. Um, and it's not normal that this is publicly available for people to understand and see what's happening. This is fixing ICs that are currently being manufactured, which is something you'd never hear about, um, but is actually somewhat common in the industry. Um, and so with MPW, um, uh, sorry, with Chip Ignite 1, we had a metal layer fix that we applied or eFabless applied to Chip Ignite. Um, and we had a different fix that we applied to MPW2 and MPW3 because they hadn't been sent for manufacturing yet. Um, they had a different fix, which was re-changing the harness. And so with that fix, we sent those off for manufacturing. Um, but what we discovered is that despite hardware people um, saying that these chips that were part of MP1, MPW1 were dead on arrival and nobody was going to get anything useful out of them, it turns out people in our program had never done chips before and also didn't know it wasn't going to work. And so they came up with a bunch of really cool ways to actually make the chip work. And this is super exciting as well because it shows what people can do when they're given the freedom to try stuff. And so what we actually have is that MPW1 actually does work. It doesn't work as well as we would like. And we definitely learned a lot from MPW1, but it wasn't just dead. And one of the really cool things, and I hope Matt Venn maybe has some more time to go into this, is that Matt Venn now has a clock on his desk which is powered by the ASIC that he designed on MPW1. And I believe Matt Venn was even able to verify that all his other designs on his MPW1, because he did multiple designs in one slot, um, were actually working. So what the real status of MPW1 was is that, yes, there were early issues, but solutions were found to these issues, and we actually still learnt a huge amount from MPW1. As well, um, in the meantime, we got silicon back from Chip Ignite um, 
one which had this metal layer fix. And what we found is these chips worked. Here is a post from Weston um, showing his testing of his analog circuit. Um, and that worked. Here you can see a, a day at um, Stanford where a bunch of students were working on getting their ICs um, running um, as part of the Chip Ignite program. And so where we are today is we have a bunch of working ICs. We have MPW1, which had issues, but solutions were found. And MPW2 and MPW3 should be back very soon. The other thing is, since we had silicon back from MPW1, there was more things that happened. With the first chips, we actually taped out Open RAM, which is a fully open source memory generator from Matt Goodhouse and the University of Santa Cruz. Um, and with that chip, a guy called Andrew Zonenberg did fully open source characterization of Open RAM. So there's a three part video series of how he actually tests the SRAM that you can attempt to do as well. And all his data and all his designs are open source and you can take these and use them to do your own characterization. And so where we're at is that we've actually got a lot of interesting silicon back already, but even when the silicon isn't necessarily that interesting, we're also seeing that people are doing things like imaging the chips. At the Open Tapeout Conference, um, John McMaster, who I know as the guy who has a SEM in his garage, um, actually posted a bunch of uh, imaging of various Skywater chips um, that you can go and see. If you go to his Silicon Prawn website, you can actually see these chips and see how they work. As well, um, we were getting SEM images of the stack up. Here you can see an image of the stack up that is available on um, the Skywater PDK website. And on the other side is a real SEM image of a cross section, and you can see how they're connected to each other. I think this is really cool. This is Matt Venn's, um, you know, many projects um, that are shown in a GDS render, and next to it is a microscope image of his chip. And you can see, like, the visual connection between the two and how they actually compare. And this is all available for anyone to look at now. This is something that only professionals previously were able to get into, and now anyone can do it. As well, we're getting full imaging of things like the test tile, which allows us to understand how the Sky 130 um, process technology actually works and performs. And in partnership with NIST, we've taken that test tile and we've done characterization of the Skywater process at very cold temperatures like 4 Kelvin. And our plan is to have the raw data for this process technology be available. So you can check that the raw data actually matches the SPICE models that are produced by this raw data, or you can go and measure it yourself and see whether the results match the results that we have measured. And this is something that really wasn't possible before or possible at scale. I've sent these test tiles now to probably 20 different individuals, and each of them is starting to collect data about this process technology. And I don't know of any other process technology that has that many different independent groups actually looking at it. To make things even more exciting, we've started to add new stuff 
to the Sky 130 process. For MBW4, we added support for RERAM so that anybody on the program can add RERAM to their design. The RERAM that is currently there doesn't have a lot of you know, pre-built use cases ready for you to go, but if you want to use RERAM in something, you can. And we've seen a bunch of people start doing interesting things, and we plan to support RERAM in all our MPWs going forward. Even more excitingly, what we've seen is that it's enabling a large percentage of people who otherwise wouldn't have been designers are now designers. For MPW1, 60% of the designs were done by people who had never done an ASIC before. For MPW2, one third self-identified as software devs. And I think this is pretty amazing because I keep hearing this um, these talks about how nobody wants to go into IC design anymore. This clearly shows if you give people tooling and access, there are plenty of people who do want to do ICs. We've also seen this massive explosion in different types of designs. Um, they are highly varied. Some are, you know, analog systems, some are EFPGAs, some are socks. You know, there's even a crypto miner, all these type of things. Um, there's plenty of risk five cores. Um, and we just keep seeing new and interesting things um, happen. What we've also seen is our partner Fabulous was able to use this form of program to create a MPW program called Chip Ignite, which means it's less than 10,000 USD to do your own chip. And because it's a commercial uh, program, you don't need your design to be fully open source. And if you want a thousand parts, um, each part only costs you $20. And that part is packaged, ready to go. Um, so I think that is significantly cheaper than I've seen anybody else able to do in this space. And it's available to anyone who eFabless is able to do business with. To make things even cooler, Matt Venn pioneered this idea of using the MPW programs like Google's Open MPW and Chip Ignite to be an MPW in itself. Because both these programs are designed to get you back a large number of ICs packaged ready to go, if you take something like 16 projects and put them in one slot, each project is going to get back five ICs, which even further reduces the cost to something that is significantly more accessible. And I think this is really cool because Matt Venn released these tools so that anybody can do this. If you want to run a MPW program as part of your own course, you can do this now, either through the Open MPW program or through Chip Ignite. Um, so it really makes it accessible to almost anyone. So with that success in the last year, what is next? Well, our plans for 2022 is that we're going to add a second foundry. We have signed contracts with them, and we hope um, that's going to be launched in about a month and a half. We're also going to hopefully launch a 90 nanometer program um, and a 180 nanometer program. In both these process nodes, the process will be fully open source, available on GitHub under Apache 2 license, and there'll be an associated um, shuttle program where if your design is open source, um, you won't um, have to pay because Google will be footing the cost here. Um, and I believe Chip Ignite for these process um, technologies will probably come soon after that as well, depending on eFabulous's ability to um, you know, make that happen. So that's really cool. Um, we're also looking at cloud-based access to more advanced PDKs than 90 nanometers um, through things like Google Cloud Platform. Um, and hopefully we'll have something in that area before the end of the year. We're also expanding our partnership with NIST to um, add support for nanotechnology acceleration 
um, basically to make it easier for people to collect large amounts of data about their nanotechnology designs. And this is like a wafer that you purchase, the entire wafer, and it's been planarized, which allows you then to build your um, nanotechnology um, on top of that. And that will be significantly cheaper way to um, have these support structures needed to test nanotechnology. And if you look at the open source tools, um, currently the Open Road project really supports really well Sky 130 because it's an open source process technology. And so we have almost 250, 300 ish designs done with these open source tools and this open source process technology. Um, open Road continues to plan to um, support these older technologies from other foundries. And um, we hope to see a collection that looks more like this by the end of the year. Um, but these open source tools, while they are a focus for us at these old technologies because it's extremely cheap, actually do support more advanced nodes. If you have access to these advanced nodes under NDA, like GF12LP, you can actually use the same tools you use for Sky130 to do a tape out at this advanced 12 nanometer FinFET node. And the University of Michigan actually taped out a open FA SOC based design with a bunch of open Titan RTL on 12 nanometers using the open source tools and sent it off for manufacturing. And that chip has recently come back and maybe we'll get news soon whether or not that worked. Um, I'm pretty confident it will, but we'll see. Um, there's also support for um, Intel's 22 FFL process, or I think it's called Intel 16 now, um, in Open Road. And so um, you can actually do advanced process technologies with these open source tools. Um, if you have access to those PDKs under NDA. And what we're seeing is that work for Sky130 is actually also improving the quality for these advanced process nodes. And what we really need in this industry is a lot more portability to enable easier reuse. I think about the um, industry in a bunch of different areas. And if you look at planned open road support, this is kind of what my internal map looks like. Um, and what we really need is process portability, where you can take a design that you taped out at an older process node and pull it into a new process node without having to do a full redesign. We need foundry portability, i.e. you can take a design that's done on Skywater 130 and move it to GF um, 130 without having to do a full redesign. We also need technology portability. We need to be able to move from a bulk process to an FDSOI process, for example, without having to redesign everything from scratch. And this type of true portability is a goal we're looking to. And we really think the open source tools can enable this. And we're already seeing examples of this. Um, if you remember back to when I said we were funding integration with um, open source EDA tools, one area we did fund was analog generation. And the analog generation really helps with that area that I was saying was blocking open collaboration, the area of missing IP. When we started work with OpenFA SOC, it was a um, based around proprietary tooling like Synopsys Design Compiler and Cadence Innovus. Um, but we funded the work so that uh, FASOC could produce an open version where instead it used the open source tools. 
This was also paired with the open source process technology Sky 130. And through that, what we discovered is that this open FASOC approach enabled analog generators to be portable between very different process technologies. The same generator that targets Sky 130, which is a 130 nanometer planar bulk process, could also target GF12 LP, which is a 12 nanometer FinFET process. And that is, I think, a truly an amazing result. And they've shown this with a bunch of different generators. They've shown this with an LDO, and they've continued to iterate on their LDO design and continue to improve the performance of their LDO design. And what they've seen is that this iteration improves performance not only on the old process node, but on the new process node as well. They also have a PLL, they have a SAR ADC, and remember that GF12 LP tape out that I talked about earlier, this had a bunch of their analog design automatically generated on it. So they had this 12 LP design sock, which has the little um, you know, example up in the corner. Um, and it has a bunch of analog like D to D C to DC converters and a fully mixed signal sock. They were able to take that and tape out the same RTL and the same analog generators on Sky 130. First, they did the temperature sensors and the DLO, and they produced some really interesting results. Um, the really cool thing is, though, because of the generator approach, they were able to generate a huge number of different versions. So we were able to see a lot of different variants and how the performance changed. They were also able to take um, the full sock and generate that and the supporting infrastructure on Sky 130. So this is pretty cool. They've got a project where they can target an advanced process technology and an old process technology. And they'll continue to iterate on this old process technology because it's significantly cheaper. Here you can see them iterating on the temperature sensor design and iterating on the LDO design. So what this is giving us is transferable analog, analog that works on an old process technology and a new process technology. Because it's generator based, the actual designs do look fairly different in the final result, but the performance looks comparable. And what we're seeing here is that actual work on an old process technology like 130 nanometers is directly benefiting work on 12 nanometers. And because 130 nanometers is so much cheaper than 12 nanometers, they were able to do four tape outs at 130 nanometers in the same time and effort they were able to do one tape out on 12 nanometers. And I think that's really, really cool. It totally disrupts the way we think about the current industry where you have to be on the most advanced node to do anything interesting. This is showing you can do a lot of interesting things where it's extremely cheap to iterate and do lots of versions and then get that benefit when you move to a more advanced node. And all this was really enabled through open FA SOC integrating with the open road, open source tooling. And this really wouldn't be possible without the fully open source nature of these solutions. So in summary, my group is aiming for faster, cheaper, and more custom silicon. We're looking for growths 
that are, you know, not in the 10x, but like the 1000x. As of today, we launched a new developer portal that is starting to document a lot of the work. We also have an associated blog post, which you can read about some of the things we're doing. And we expect to iterate pretty quickly on this site. Um, but that's pretty much the end of my talk.